So it's 5.01 p.m. on February 22nd. I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting to order. Um, would you like to call a select board meeting to order? Sure, I'll call the select board meeting to order. All right, first item on the agenda is review and approve previous minutes. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. February 17th. Date. Yeah, whatever was uh, one February. week ago. February 17th. February 17th, 17th minutes. Thursday. Oh, it was Thursday. Okay, that's why it's not minus seven. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? Just great job, Jim, on those minutes. I, I didn't do a, a printout. We've all seen it. Any discussion? I've lost John. Oh, he's there. Good. Okay. <laughs> um. Sounds like no discussion. Let's do, we'll have to do a roll call vote since we're a hybrid. Um, why don't we start here? Beth Brown. <laughs> John, what are we doing? <laughs> we're voting for the minutes. Oh, John Presti, I'm sorry. Julie Chalp and I. Can be a sign. Allison Vanderveld and I. John Turk. Can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he's not saying anything either. John Paturic, can you hear us? No. John. Me. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Hang on the minutes. Was that an I? Yeah, it does. All right, let's just call it one, two, three, four, five, zero, zero, and move on. Um, all right, so we are ready for the library budget. Um, Hi, Candace. <coughs> so do you want to start us in? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, I also want to welcome Marjorie Shearer from the, um, the Board of Trustees. So she's here with us tonight in case there is any other questions. So um, I did send the Finance Committee the, um, the budget and the kind of the breakdown detail sheet and there was a cover letter just kind of going over 600 six, series yep what we're presenting to you um i mean pretty much it's i know the request was for level funding so pretty much it's level funding um, there's a couple of items as we go through you'll notice um that went up just because the costs of, of things have gone up um and also there have been um some shifts in our in our staff salary because two people retired and we replaced, you know, we replaced them with new people. Um, one of the positions, the children's uh, librarian position uh, has been, well, basically used to be, has always been called children's librarian position, but um, but also kind of added on to that was in youth services and that <clears throat> to, you know, um, work with um, teens. And so we split that position on um, the last children's librarian's retirement. So now we have, actually I just hired um, two days ago, oh no, three days ago, um, a new staff person that's gonna be working 12 hours a week to work with teens. And so our new children's librarian is working with, um, you know, ages zero through 12. And so there's, you know, a lot of shifting and, you know, because the newer people are getting their salaries a little bit lower than would have been for the people that had been here for a while um and then with the new classification and compensation plan you know there's been some shifts and some some of the existing titles with the existing staff as well as the um hourly pay um so basically let's see if you look at the salaries like i said it's a little a little all over the place because of the shifts you know my salary's gone up a little bit the children's librarian went down a little bit. Um, the head of adult services, which is the new title for the head of adult circulation, which is a, a new person, um, just went up a, a little bit. Um, one of our library assistance positions went down a little bit. Um, I'm also, what I'm reading is fine print, <laughs> it's small. So um, let's see, so another, some other library assistants, um, just because of shift in their in their hours, have gone down. And you can see the head of adult young head of young adult services 
is a new line item um, at the $14,028. And for books, audio, video, and all everything that makes up our collection, whether it's, it's really expanded over the years. It's not just what you see at the library. It's also, um, you know, things that you can get online, eBooks, e-audio books, um, streaming content, like, you know, television shows and movies and documentaries and what we call our library of things. You know, we have a, a ukulele, a sewing machine. We have Wi-Fi hotspots. We have snowshoes. We have, um, astronomy kit we have a dvd player you know it's just like that's just the, the the world of libraries expanding but basically so that's what that what that line item covers and um we're required by the state in order to get state aid for that to go up a certain percentage every year um the supplies just uh, the cost of supplies have gone up and so i that had been level for many years and so i, I brought that up to a more realistic level um, I, I kept the electricity and the heating oil and the static IP fee and the water at the same level. The buildings and building and grounds is a little bit higher and that's because, let's see what went up. Um, the uh, maintenance for our lift, which is um, an elevator um, it went up and also uh, grounds management, like the um, landscaping, you know, the, the mowing and um, shoveling, all that stuff, that price went up. Um, let's see, going back to the budget. Uh, insurance, equipment, technology and website, those are all level. Um, professional development dues. That's basically our um, what we pay to be a part of our network, the uh, CWMRs network. Um, that went up just a little bit. Uh, postage, professional development postage and programs, um, pretty much level funded. And then you'll see after that what offsets the, the actual municipal budget. And so the Tilton Library Dickinson Trust offsets that by $2,262 this year. The Tilton Fund will offset um, the budget by 15,000. The state aid that, we're, that we receive, I'm estimating it's, you know, it, I don't know the exact amount for our fiscal year 2023, but I'm estimating um, 8,500 will be given to us. Uh, the Friends, um, we have a budget of $4,500 that will offset the municipal budget and then we also get from the state what's called the Small Libraries and Network Grant. And that is offset by $2,200. And finally, um, other grants like the Cultural Council Grant um, and other small grants that we get mostly for programming um, will offset that. And at the very bottom, just employees that have been here over a certain amount of time and they get their longevity pay. So that all adds up to $202,983, which is um 4.5 percent increase and if you look across from previous years it's kind of in the middle we had a couple of years 2018 2019 that were higher percentage um 5.54 percent 6.90 percent and then we had a couple of years well we had one year where we made a cut 2000 um you know when COVID started down to 0.87 percent but then we had a couple of years that were like two and three percent so this feels like it's kind of um in the middle somewhere and it, it's largely due to the, um, the staff salary because of the new classification um, plan. So that's what I have. Questions? Go ahead, John. Yes. The hours in this budget compared to what the hours would be in fiscal year, yeah, I know it's not over yet, but expected in fiscal year 22? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, how are the hours in the fiscal year 23 budget compared to what you, we expect the hours will total for fiscal year 22? Are they the same or are they increased? Or? Do you mean the operation hours or the staff hours? The staff hours. Staff hours. <laughs> uh, they're pretty much the same because the, um, the children's librarian position was, um, was split into two positions. That's probably adding maybe five hours 
Um, but what the position that because because of um, luck and someone that was um, highly skilled and qualified, that is the library children's librarian. She was an internal candidate, and so basically the teen librarian is taking those hours and still doing the stuff that that the former library assistant um, did, which was which is you know assisting with technology, assisting with marketing and outreach, but also going to be doing um, teen focused um, work. But overall, it's about the same. Yes. So is the, the children's librarian is at the same number of hours and the new teen librarian, the children's librarian has fewer hours? Yeah, uh, two, two, it took two hours to put towards the teen librarian. And um, and I expected the teen librarian was gonna start off with a lot fewer hours because it's a position that we're, it's new and we wanna grow it you know, incrementally because we don't have the room in our budget to, you know, to just give them a whole bunch of new hours that we didn't have in our budget before, but because we hired an internal candidate we, were, we had the hours available. And so um, and so we figured that taking a, a small percentage of the children's librarian to give, because we're taking away the work with teens from that position, that, that we could contribute those to the um, to the teen librarian position. One Carol? more. Um, oh, on, sorry. on the building and grounds maintenance, you said that includes lawn mowing and snow clearing i believe well not the plowing but the you know like the walkways the treatment the okay. the snow blower the shoveling the treatment is that contracted out or yes yeah, so sokolowski i just wonder if it would be better if, if town employees did it something to consider I, or look into i think we've discussed this before and Kevin is has a pretty skeleton crew, crew and when it comes to snow removal, I, I believe, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought he had said that he couldn't uh, fit that into. Candace, do you remember? Yeah, I think that, that I think pre-COVID, he was gonna work on, well, at least getting, um, I don't know about um, grounds maintenance, but at least the, um, you know, like janitorial staff for the town, because we also, you know, just like, um, the town offices do, you know, we contract that out as well. I don't remember him talking about the, um, the grounds, but I know they're, they're working um, the skeleton crew and Sokolowski is really great because they have to get everything clear before we open. Um, and um, so they're really great at getting things done on a, on a very reliable schedule. It is a high cost, but if the town was able to hire more staff to do that, then, you know, perhaps that could be a discussion in the future. Thank you. Carolyn? Carolyn, you have a question? Yeah, I just was wondering how you're doing on the heating oil this year uh, for the heating costs. I, I I almost feel like you've got to add a little bit more for next year. Well, let's see. Let me look at the... I mean, it really, you know, it's, it's really tripled from where it was last year. Yeah. But yeah, um, I, I think that when I first put, put this budget together, we hadn't received our first bill yet, uh, our first full bill. Um, so probably it would be fair to say that we might need to add on to that because of the, the rise in fuel prices. Yeah, I, I would want you to do that, I think. What would you recommend? Well, I don't know if I do it by three, but, uh, you know, because the, the cost might come down, but I would definitely at least do 50% more, maybe. So 6,000 as opposed to what, what's your, what did you think your usage is so far based on your bill that you got? Um, I don't have it in front of me, so it's hard to say. I, I have the cost that what we've spent on heating oil through the end of January is a thousand fifty for the library. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and do you remember what it compared to last year, Brenda? I don't. Okay. Well, at least I would put some more in for next year. Um, I don't know. I mean, the oil fluctuates, but right now it's over $100 per, you know, crude oil gallon. So, I mean, you know, the barrels. So I would at least expect some increase. Okay. Um, 
yeah, I don't know if that's something, a figure that I would have to come back to the finance committee with or something that we could decide now. Um, so what, what would you advise? I don't know how Julie feels. Uh, the heating oil, it looks like you budgeted 4,000. We've spent 1,050. We're more than halfway through the year and more than halfway mm. through the winter. Um, so I think that's a ample budget for this year. And I would recommend just keeping the, I think that the 4,000 that's in the budget is already a nice aggressive number for that line item. I don't okay. know the committee feels. Maybe I would just, Candace, then just keep an eye on the oil prices. And so when they're really low in the summer, try to fill up or something. Okay. Just keep in mind if, you know, watch the prices. Okay. Any other questions? On the programs line item, it's gone from 4,000 to 4,950. Is there a specific program you're looking at adding? Uh, that's because um, th with the cultural count, cultural council programs that's what that's what it added up to and then you'll see with the other grants that's the offset so we had the cultural council we had five people apply for grants to do programs at the library and um so so that will be the offset for that okay thanks anybody else have questions we actually don't have a motion out yet. Would anybody like to move this? Can make a motion to approve the Tilton Library uh, budget 610-5400 uh, at 202-983. We have a second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right. Um, if it's hybrid, even if we're all here, do we still have to do the roll call vote? Anybody know? I think so. Yes. Yes, you do. Allison Vandervelde and I. James Camby is I. Julie Chalf and I. Jim Rumstead abstaining. John Pareski I. So that's five zero one. That passes. Um, you know, that's your only budget, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk for just a few minutes on where we are with the capital project? Uh, sure. Actually, we just we just had a meeting last week with um, the select board and the um, CIPC. And, um, and so we're going to be meeting with them again because there were some questions that we had to come back with answers to. Um, so basically, you know, it's, it's pretty certain it's like, it's pretty much 100% that we're going to be getting the grant in July, you know, it hasn't been offered officially, but you know, the, the state um, granting um, agency has, is talking as if. And um, so, you know, so there's the $8 million that's um, earmarked for the project. And, you know, we've hired the libraries hired a fundraising consultant that we've already started work with that we're, uh, we're going to be adding to what we've already raised, which is $750,000. Um, in the last um, six years to, uh, of pledges and gifts, committed committed pledges and gifts towards the project. And our goal is to raise 2 million. So the fundraising consultant is gonna work with the with a committee, a library capital campaign committee to raise you know, up to that goal. And, um, and because the, the project, I mean, the grant isn't offered until after the annual town meeting uh, we get the offer in July that we'll be going to a special town meeting, you know, sometime in the fall, and then it will go to a vote, uh, an election vote um, after that. Um, because of the change and costs, building costs, and it's been six years since our um, original estimate, we are going to be getting um, the architect and the OPM, the owner's project manager, to do a, an updated estimate. Um, and we have to work with the CIPC to get the money to do that um, because it costs money for them to put an estimate together. But uh, I have confidence that'll go through and then we'll have numbers that, um, so when the grant comes through, you know, we'll, we'll have numbers about, you know, what the 
what the you know the architect and the OPM are confident that the cost could be, even though it's it could fluctuate quite a bit, and um, and answer other questions like as far as like how it would affect how it would impact people's tax bills, um, things like that. So a year from now, we could be looking at the starting of a of, of our project, um, and you know if we get a, a yes vote and um, so anyway, and then we also found out from the CIPC meeting, I had some questions I had to go back to the state with, to the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And um, it was my understanding, um, sort of being new to this project, um, you know, after Sarah did a lot of the le early legwork, that the state, the town would be paying the state, but it doesn't work that way. The town pays the bills and as the bills come in and it's, you know, it's gonna be coming in increments, like the first year is de design development, the second year would be construction. And, um, and the state would reimburse the town back um, over five years, 20% of their you know, $4 million um, every year. And, um, and she's gonna be coming, our rep to the MBLC is gonna be coming to the next CIPC collective meeting to kind of explain that more. So, so what's happening? And uh, we're feeling confident about um, you know, community financial support um, and um, just doing the best we can. So what's your, what's your timing estimate for the, um, oh gosh, redoing the estimate on the? Well, um, I don't, I'm not, what I'm not sure of, of yet is if the, uh, the money for the new estimate has to be voted on um, at town meeting. So if it does, um, then they'll have numbers like in, you know, in June probably. Um, if we can get, because I'm still not clear how we get that money. Um, that's something Casey and I have been talking about and have to figure out with the CIPC, um, that if they can somehow approve that before or outside of town meeting, then um, they could get that sooner. So, so that, that uh, it all depends. But the goal is to have that done before the town votes on the accepting the grant. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Trevor, yeah, because what we want to do is we want to have numbers, we want to have updated numbers because we're going to be, as soon as we get the grant, we're going to hit the ground running and, you know, there'll be a lot of press about the project, there'll be a lot of marketing, there'll be a lot of conversations, meetings, and we want to, you know, we want to have th those numbers um, solidly in place. So, you know, we'll definitely have them uh, before we get the grant offer. So the question I had was, I wondered if we could, um, because the design is really fluid at the moment and we you know we have a we have an initial idea of what we what we would build right and i was wondering before we had a solid number on the estimate would we want to meet with the designer again and the architect again to really flush out truly what we're going to build and then get a more solid figure i mean because then it, it might be the difference between eight and eleven or ten and eight and you know somewhere in that range i didn't know if it was if, if they had thoughts that we should really yeah. group together and kind of figure out truly what we're gonna build. Um, well, um, I did meet with the architect and the, and the OPM on Friday. So I'm glad that, that I did get to talk to them about, you know, about this. And they said that um, if we're gonna, if they're gonna go back to, it would just cost more money. We'd have to give them money to do new, come up with a new design and have, have meetings and Da, da, da. And so and that's something they usually do. Usually they have their, the design that we have now, you get the grant and then you, do what's called design development, which takes time. And uh, and they said, really, as far as impacting price, um, you know, it's about materials mostly because we do have to keep the square footage and we do have to keep what's called the the program. The program is what we when we filled out the grant application, like kind of like letting doing all these you know calculations and letting them know what our needs what our needs are and what we're what what we are what we commit to, you know. Um, um, having in our in our building, you can't stray from that. Otherwise, you risk losing the state grant. Um, so, so we, the design is only fluid to a certain degree. You know, like like placement, but not square footage and materials, um, things like that. And that could that could affect the price, but not in a huge amount. And if we are going to ask them to do that before they were expecting to go into design development, it's going to cost money to to have them do that. So they have it figured in their budget and their estimate to us to do that design work. Out oh yeah, 
grant oh, yeah. award yeah. versus before the grant is award. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And this is a this I'm pretty sure this is something that's decided by the state agent the state library agency. I think they have a very a very structured um, you know uh, process for all this. And um, if you go outside the process, you you know there's just extra steps or extra money. Um, Yeah, Candace, my, I don't have a lot of experience in buildings. The one that I had some experience with was the current South Deerfield Elementary School. And when we built that, uh, the state had a dollar per square foot estimate that they required us to use. At that point in time, I think it was $125 a square foot, but don't hold me to it. Uh, and the building, the architect that we had hired had laid out a building, obviously not complete, but he'd laid out uh, a, a plan that had 64,000 square feet. So 64,000 times 125 bucks was 8 million. And that's what we asked the town to borrow was the $8 million. So I'm, I'm curious, do you have a square foot size for your building and could the architect or the state give you uh, a per square foot cost that could be used? Someplace along the way, I can't imagine that we can do much else but have those two numbers. Um, uh, or you could, can't really do much else but have if you don't have those two numbers. Yeah, at this point, because I, I didn't come prepared uh, for this meeting with any of those um, numbers, I don't have that with me. Um, so I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, at a future meeting, um, you know, especially since we are going to be meeting with the um, select board and the capital improvements um, committee, you know, soon within a couple of weeks, whenever their next meeting is, and we are going to have the owner's project manager and if the architect's available, you know, maybe he can come too. And then we also, I'm going to invite the, um, our rep at the MBLC, um, the state library agency. And I think that that would be a place where with all those people at the meeting that we could answer those questions much better than just me alone. Um, so right now I don't have that information um, for this meeting. And, and yeah. the last question is, is there expectation that at this coming town meeting in April, that there will be anything on the uh, town meeting warrant concerning the library building itself, or that will come the summer after you receive the, assuming you receive the grant? Yeah, that would come um, after um, what we're sort of been, sort of banking on. It seems that um, there's been a pattern for in the town for like the last ten or so years that there's a, a special town meeting usually in September, that we would be a part of that special town meeting. If that, if there isn't any need for any other um, special town meeting, then we would have our own. Um, and it would be, yeah, probably in like September, October, the latest, I guess. Um, but yeah, the only thing that's a possibility that would come up for the, uh, to be an article on the, um, the annual town meeting in April would be um, asking for the money, the, $25,000 for the architect and the OPM to do a new estimate. So we, so, and I guess in this case, I'm also on the capital improvement committee and we'll be meeting after this meeting tonight. Should we anticipate putting 25,000, a request for 25,000 just for hiring the architect? Uh, to for them to do a new estimate. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, um, and yeah, as soon as I um, know when the next CIPC meeting is, um, I'll arrange for all, for all of us to be there so we can, you know, I'll talk about that project and those, um, those questions. Did I get a vote on the budget? Oh, we already voted it. Yeah, that was on. Time. Oh, it's oh, I, I didn't. I didn't know that you had. I, I know you had a motion and a second. I didn't know if you had any. Um, 
Oh no, we voted it. It passed five zero one. Oh, okay. Somehow I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> Candace. Yeah. The next CIPC meeting is at seven tonight. So if you want to listen to that to find out when the next one is. Oh, okay. So they'll 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 make a date at that at that meeting. Okay. Good to know. All right. Thank All right. you very much for coming to the meeting. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Candace, Marjorie. You Thanks, Candace. See you. All right. Hi, Zach. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so where is your budget? His budget is in tab 10. Tab 10. Um, oh, sewer steps. There we go. Yeah. After the sewer, correct. Why don't we start with a motion and then you can present your budget? Oh. Do you have it? It's in tab 10. It's, it's the kind last, of blue gray. It's the last in. one before okay. tab 11. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, you have it. That's it. It just says yeah, scan. Oh, you're true. right. It is missing a bottom line. There's oh, no total. Yeah, missing the bottom line. If, so, if you look on the back side, oh, we don't have <gasps> the back side. It didn't. You don't have a backside. So How in the heck did that up? happen? <laughs> Put a zero on there. It's called burying yeah. the lead. Yeah. Burying the lead. Yeah. 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 Let me Trying get the rest something. of the yeah. right. Great. Um, I guess the punchline on that is uh, <laughs> um, Deerfield's share uh, in this budget for FY23 is $397,966. Um, that is Deerfield's share of the $1.5 million service. Um, should we wait for yeah. Brenda to? Yeah, 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 yeah we'll, we great, no problem. You can see those amounts at the top left-hand corner as well. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. In the increase. Wow, that's a big increase. Yeah, we'll talk about that. OK. <laughs> It's like twenty five percent. Twenty eight percent. So, do you have any capital requests? So, there are no capital requests in this budget. Okay. Not, not in this budget, but separate from this that you're going to see. Correct. Yeah, for with? this fiscal year, all oh, yeah. Nothing. This nothing. Year? Nope. Okay. Did you get your, um, you got the new pavement done? And the pavement and the, so the expansion of our parking lot to include parking for our personnel and the exhaust source capture system is all in this year's existing budget. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Scarborough is handing, handling all of that. So by nature of being a town of Deerfield facility and actually his expertise in both of those things specifically. Thank you. <clears throat> and so we should expect to see those uh, very soon. They were going to be in the springtime. Thank you, Brenda. All right. So, do we have a motion for this budget? Do you like to move this budget? I'll make a motion to uh, approve the SCEMS Enterprise Fund budget for so we can discuss it. Can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. we, we don't get to approve the budget. We just do that for a So can we change those? Say that we recommend. Can you move the microphone so we could hear? Sorry. No, what I said was that the Finance Committee uh doesn't get to approve the budget what we do is we recommend the budget to town meeting so this is this is a recommendation that we're making to town meeting that's all as opposed to so-called approving it and i don't care how you specify it so long as when the vote's taken it it says that we're recommending it John moved it. Zach seconded. All right. 
tell us the story. So the story here is this is for level service. So we're not expanding our services at South County EMS or anything like that. Um, I want to start for our people at home. I know this is going to be a quick rehash for everybody in the room. Um, but South County EMS, by nature of us being an enterprise fund, everything's transparent. So not only do our day-to-day -day expenses, the Band-Aids and things like that um, are represented, but also the salaries and also the benefits, um, also the money that we expect for revenue when we bill uh, health insurance. Um, and all of that is on the paper in front of us. So there's some um, accounting that we need to familiarize ourselves again with at home. So level services here, the two major factors that are in play that are creating the increase in the budget for Deerfield, and I think we calculated it like at 20%. The two major things here is retained earnings, and that's playing the majority of the part here. So our retained earnings are the money that exists in the enterprise fund for South County EMS that roll over year to year. So because we are accountable for everything, including employee benefits, we're trying to fund it um, transparently also with the revenue from billing. So because of COVID, we actually, so we saw an incredible burden on healthcare providers during COVID, but because the hospital is where sick people go, a lot of people stopped calling 911, or when they did call 911, they actually chose to not be transported to the hospital during the height of COVID. And that's when we are allowed to bill health insurance for reimbursement. So we saw a decrease in revenue through COVID. So we remember COVID was like calendar year 2020, so it kind of spanned fiscal year 20 and into 21. Well, those retained earnings specifically in 21 is what's being represented here. So on the second page, um, revenue from service and retained earnings, we were typically putting in somewhere between two hundred dollars and $300,000 a year in retained earnings. And because we're an enterprise fund, because that money comes back, that would ostensibly keep our budget level, right? So if we got more money back than we were expecting, we would reduce our, our assessment for the following year. And it dropped off precipitously for this budget because of COVID. We were able to weather the COVID storm while it was happening. We didn't have any budgetary shortfalls because of our retained earnings and the way that we do it. But now this is where we're feeling that impact. Um, from COVID. So we're only able to take $173,000 of retained earnings towards this budget. So that was the, the first major cause and probably the largest cause for the, the increase in assessment. The other one is <coughs> the personnel costs. And this comes straight from the supplied recommended or suggested class comp study. And the majority of our staff, all of our per diems and our new paramedics are all low enough in the class comp step range that the new class comp is increasing their hourly rates to bring in line with what the market is, but increasing them $3 an hour, $4 an hour, that type of thing. So even though well, not even though, because of that change in the class comp, um, like all of our per diems are going from about $23 an hour to $29 an hour. Um, so that's the other increase. We are, I said this is for level services, same number of, uh, same type of service, same amount of coverage. We are rethinking the way that we're staffing and allocating the money that we're budgeted. So you'll notice a significant decrease in overtime here. That is by reallocating money that was either going unspent or not going spent, wasn't being spent smartly to better staff, more smartly staff. So we're trying to do our best here to decrease employee burnout, decrease on the job injuries, things like that, sick day usage. Um, but that class comp is just causing those salaries to, to increase that much. Um, other than that, uh, the subtle changes here and there, uh, one of them is the indirect cost for Deerfield, that's based on a percentage of the resources that we use from the town, like the accounting, the clerk, a town administrator, legal, things like that. Um, and other than that, our, our operating expenses are, are consistent. So we're not anticipating or seeing any major jump there. 
Um, you know, even with the increase in cost of healthcare supplies last year, the decrease in call volume meant that we weren't using as much. So those expenses have remained uh, relatively flat. Our transport rate is up though. Um, it has recovered and we actually are higher than ever before. Uh, yeah, that's that's an excellent point, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have rebounded from that COVID decrease. So not only is our call volume the highest it has ever been, but our revenue from the insurance billing is also higher than it has ever been. So you'll actually see in our estimations for medical service fees revenue, we've increased it by $50,000 in this upcoming um, budget year from 525,000 to 575,000. I'm reluctant to increase it more than that. We, I, I'm shooting right around $600,000, give or take, for the <clears throat> expected revenue. But any money that we make, if we make 600,000, that 25,000 will roll over into the following year and decrease our assessments by that much. It is because we always kind of estimate this a little bit on the on the uh, safe side that we were able to weather COVID and we didn't find any shortfalls with the budgeting or being able to pay our staff or anything like that. So I do think it's safe to raise it. Um, it'll, we'll need some more data to see if we can raise it in future years beyond that though. So you, know, you expect to uh, transport more people? Yes, yeah. Then I would think, I hate to say it, but I would think the operating expenses would have to go up also. You're going to use more Band-Aids, right? Uh, yes, uh, a lot of what we do is the, the supply themselves isn't the expensive thing. It's the knowledge and the expertise of the paramedics and their staff. When we do an EKG, a 12-lead EKG, that is what you are getting for that cost of a paramedic level ambulance, but really what you're paying for is the expertise of the paramedic. A, a set of 12 little EKG electrodes, you know, we're talking pennies for each. So even though our call volume is going up by 8% year on year, our expenses aren't going up in the equipment side to match that. It's, it's the, the staff or what is covering that. I would sort of assume that the cost of the ambulance fuel, those costs would go up too, but you're, you're also, your income presumably is going up. Yeah, so what the reimbursement, not only do we get reimbursed from insurance based on the skills that we provide and the level of the assessment that we provide, but we get reimbursed for mileage rates as well. So, you know, that's covering the wear and tear on the ambulances and the, and the fuel and things like that. Ambulance cost is up. It's up significantly. We're not looking to replace an ambulance this upcoming year or even the year after. But last I heard, I like up 20%, 25%. We do every year take some of our retained earnings that we made from our revenue above what we estimated, and we put it aside for that eventual ambulance replacement. So we are on track for a four to five year ambulance replacement schedule. I don't know what that's gonna look like in two or three years about what ambulance costs are gonna be then, but you're right, we're looking at that. Um, and the as far as fuel goes, fuel price is going up. Um, it has been going up. We are currently on track based on our expense reports thus far to hit our, our budget estimation of, I think it's $10,000 is what we budgeted. We're right on track for that right now. Um, you know, that's the information I'm going off of. If you know personally what fuel prices are going to do, you know, in two weeks or two months or two years from now, um, we should talk about maybe some sort of side money making venture. Um, but as of now, I think that this estimation not changing that um, in this budget is, is the most appropriate thing to do. And we do, as part of this enterprise fund, we have operational reserves. We have $100,000 in our budget that if something unforeseen happens, if fuel prices double overnight, or we have some unexpected um, expense, that significant expense, we can go into our operational reserve money to help fund that and not run out of money. Um, so there is, there's always that um, to consider as well. I Personally, I think we need, I think you need to look at each operating expense line item 
and say, is it going to go up because of the increase in volume? And mm -hmm. granted, Band-Aids might not be expensive, but if you take each line item, I mean, the revenue is going up what percent? How the volume is going to go up? Um, uh, approximately... Our volume, our, yeah, our call volume has been going up about 8% year on year. Sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's So is this 8% here? The 575 versus 525? Then shouldn't we be going up 8% on some of these operating expenses? Yeah, like I said, so our... I, I acknowledge that each one by itself is not a lot, but um, I think it needs to be acknowledged. Sure, yeah. Myself, it's my opinion. Did we, did we use the operational reserve? No, we haven't needed to. So there's no. 100,000 that we haven't touched. Right. Um, you know, I'm looking at. Uh, oh, yeah, I've, I've got all these previous years right. here. Thank we, you, though. We might be over a little bit on fuel, but then you're most likely going to be under on vehicle repairs and maintenance. Um, of the new vehicles. Uh, Yep. The uniforms and laundry, we usually don't spend quite that much. So I think you've got a little cushion here, you know, that that uh, there's going to be some accounts that might be overspent and there's going to be some accounts that are going to be underspent. But that's that's typical of any budget. You're never mm -hmm. going to be able to get it just right. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, right? I think there's, there's, I certainly, we've had, we've been since 2014 now. So we've really been honing this, bu this budget. And I think, you know, if I look at our, our medical expenses for COVID, um, times we had budgeted 19,000 and we spent 22. Um, and so if I could increase it to 23 for this upcoming year, we might only spend 17, you know, so it's, it's one of the, it's going to be a little bit of a moving target universally. Yeah, it always um, is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I certainly worth, and especially with more years under our belt to do, you know, a rolling five-year average and, and things like that as well. And you've got a total budget of 1.5 million. And reserve fund of 100,000. Town of Deerfield has a budget of 15 million and a reserve fund of only 100,000. I'm sorry, it's really hard for us to hear you. Well, not, what I said was Zach's budget is 1.5 million and he has within the budget a reserve fund of 100,000. Town of Deerfield has a budget of one, uh, of 15 million, 10 times that, and our reserve fund is 100,000. So there's, there's, I, I'm not, if, and if you were taking money out of the 100, planned on having to take money out of 100,000, but that, that really is a reserve fund, and if you're not using it, I don't see any reason to, not to leave it in here, mm -hmm. but I think we're probably safe even if your other numbers ended up being low, you've got that hundred thousand dollars in reserve that you can get to. Uh, I I agree with you, Skip, because um, we have the reserve fund or set up the reserve fund in case runs dropped off, and they did in fact drop off when people didn't want to go to the hospital with COVID um, happening, and um, we still didn't use our reserve fund. So I, I feel like it's really okay even though we know expenses are going up and if another variant comes through and we have ppe costs and you know our runs take a hit again but right now the trend um, we're still playing catch up with people having not gone to the hospital with conditions that normally they would have um, have gotten more severe so you know our runs are going up so we aren't in, and we have intercepts as an income um, and that, that pays us quite a bit of money. So um, I, I feel pretty comfortable not increasing this. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask for clarification. You said that the, the number of service calls had gone up. I think you said 8%. Is that basically recovering to what they were or at least more or less the line that they were on before the pandemic or are people falling down a lot more? No, uh, it, it's recovered and then some. Um, yeah. We were consistently just a tick over a thousand calls for service a year <laughs> and then COVID hit and we dropped down um, into the 900s. 
in 2021, we did 1,100 calls, and just in January alone, we did nearly 120. Um, so, how come? I mean, uh, this population is the same. Uh, the population is getting older, uh, so there's certainly that. There's, not real. <laughs> the, yeah, call volume is up, not just locally but nationwide because of that aging population. Carolyn spoke to the deferred care that we've mm -hmm. seen because of COVID. People that had chronic mild problems and they were going to their doctor consistently every six months or four months for when that care and now it's critical and they're calling 911 instead. A lot of doctor's offices now too that we've encountered, if you call your doctor with symptoms, they no longer want you coming into the office. They only wanna see healthy people. And so usually their communication is, oh, well then you should go to the emergency room. And for a lot of people that means calling an ambulance. And I think the other thing too with South County is a little bit of that field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And when people started realizing that they have 24 seven paramedics that will show up within six minutes of calling 911, that makes it a much easier bit of math to do if you are feeling ill or think you might need care. So instead of being like, well, I'll get in my car, I'll drive up, I'll be waiting in the emergency room for a few hours, blah, blah, blah. Or you know what? We have South County, we're funding South County, I'm gonna call on them. So there's a little bit of that as well. I, I think just on that, uh, with my healthcare perspective, I think that uh, health, the cracks in the healthcare system are uh, expanding and kind of spreading through and the, the ambulance, any ambulance service is the safety net for folks. And so primary care is not accessible the way it was pre-COVID for myriad reasons, staffing and, um, you know, different protocols and people's private offices going out of business and stuff like that. I think all those people are calling 911. Yeah. And we have, we have a very large population in our service area in, in Deerfield who don't have access to primary care um, because they've been marginalized to begin with and they don't have reliable transportation. And so when you need health care, the emergency room is your doctor. And if you don't have transportation that is reliable or a plan to get home, those types of things, then the ambulance is your transportation to the emergency room. So it's certainly, I, yeah, spot on. You had your hand up first. Oh, just, it's, it's your all time. Um, <clears throat> I was just gonna ask about the, I was hoping to see the overtime come down further. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing that I just keep harping on every year if you could find a way to get that down i know the call staff is, is quite a bit higher but that's because you've moved it uh to full-time you mean the call staff is way down because you've moved that kind of the full yeah full-time staff and I, I you talked a little bit offline about how you were restructuring and how you'll go and you're yeah. hoping that that'll maybe tackle the, the overtime as well i just each year just try to keep yeah that. absolutely the the overtime budget I, the overtime budget obviously represents money and so we need to be cognizant of that. I think yep. most importantly, what that represents is the healthcare providers that we're pushing to work beyond what they may have signed up for. Right. And part of this restructuring is that up until now, we actually don't have enough full-time staff to cover our ambulance 24 seven. We have relied historically for the past, what are we up to now, eight years mm -hmm. on full-time paramedics who work in Northampton and Amherst that beyond their 40 hours, they'll come and work for us. Yeah. Um, and that was great until COVID hit. And what happens is healthcare burnout. I mean, we've been seeing it all over the news, right? And so these, these poor paramedics, these poor providers had to make a judgment about, well, if I gotta go to work, I don't wanna have to then go to additional work where I might catch COVID and bring it home. Or if they're willing to do that, would they work at South County for regular straight pay or if they pull up an overtime shift at their regular job mm -hmm. for overtime, right? So we found that over, since COVID, we've been really, really struggling to fill those shifts. Yeah. And the burden has been on our local paramedics who, to their credit, I, they are signing up for these shifts because they care about the yeah. community and the service. And so, right, mm -hmm. by restructuring kind of what our, our setup is for our staff by using fewer full-timers with the equivalent cost of all those per diems um, and be able to organically cover our ambulance 24 seven internally, 
that means that we can reduce provider burnout, we can reduce the injuries. We've had um, full-time staff out on extended leaves recently, either for work-related injuries or even out of work-related injuries, but that's all related to fatigue and things like yeah. that. Um, so that will help bring that overtime budget down for sure. Great. This number was calculated um, on expected overtime kind of department wide per month, which yeah. isn't a lot. It also is representative of kind of a, a weird kookiness with our personnel bylaws and holidays and things like that. And so I know that we're, we're looking to move away from the bylaws to personnel policies and be able to kind of address those concerns better. Um, those bylaws were written before 24-7 oh, yeah. public safety in the town of Deerfield, so we're kind of working within those confines. So that would be another mechanism that we could reduce over time. Great. Even further. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask, uh, retained earnings. Yes, sir. Uh, how, what is the total of the retained earnings at this point? Uh, available to us for FY23 is $360,756. 360000 that's right now, if you'd have 360000 Yeah. And some of that's, is the hundred and, 173000 is that part of that 360 or is that 360 in addition to the 170? No, that's part of the 360. Okay, so and of the 360, I assume some of that is a set aside for replacement of the ambulance. And what is that? Yeah, so in that 360,000. Um, give me a breakdown of the 360. Yeah, I, it would be my honor. So of that $360,000, uh, 125,000 of it is money that has already been set aside in previous years for that ambulance replacement. Okay. Um, so that $125,000, a new ambulance, by the time we go to replace one, will run about $300,000, just to give perspective about mm -hmm. how much an ambulance costs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that much. And then also in that $360,000 is the $100,000 of operational reserves that wasn't spent previously. Um, so that's where that number being so large in relative to our budget is available to us in a crisis, say we need to replace an ambulance or do something um, significant. But if we don't spend it, it rolls forward and decreases our assessment by that much. So it's, it's almost like a net zero effect. If, if we don't dip into it, it, it funds itself, if that makes sense. Um, so what that leaves is, um, I think it's like a hundred and, 20 ish thousand yeah. so the decision on the board of oversight was let let's keep putting away the standard amount um, of sixty two thousand five hundred every year for that ambulance replacement um, our goal our mission right now is that our oldest ambulance should never be older than 12 years old um, we have three in the fleet that's replacing one every four years at a decade that's when the state starts getting really nervous. We're inspected by the Office of Emergency Medical Services, Department of Public Health, by the Commonwealth, every year. And part of that assessment is that our equipment is safe and reliable. And so starting at a decade, they go, you need to think about replacing it. Our plan is to replace one at 12 years. This current ambulance is, well, it's a 2007. 17, three, four, five. So what's that, 15 years old? Um, so by the time that that replacement comes around, we're gonna be knocking on 20 years old. And we don't use it that much. We use it for football game standbys, public events, parades, things like that. And it steps up to frontline duty when our other two primary ambulances need brakes replaced or need um, an oil change or something like that. Um, but it's, it's very tired. So the Board of Oversight uh, for South County EMS said, let's not defer replacing that anymore. If we're looking at 20 years, if we skip this year, you know, like what, what are we going to end up with? So we put another 62,500 for that, which left $73,256 of, I don't know how to, unaccounted yeah. for, un, un earmarked or whatever. And so that 73,000 plus the 100,000 that was rolling over anyway, gives us the $173,256 of retained earnings. 
I'd just like to mention that uh, the lead time to replace an ambulance is well over a year now. So when you go to order one, you're waiting on standby for, you know, 14 months or more right now. Uh, yeah, at this rate, we're still at least two, two years out, right, so then add another year. Um, so, right, um, we're going to be close to 20 years on that. I, he, the, the ambulance inspector was literally checking for cracks in the frame. Um, <laughs> he was underneath it at our last inspection and was shocked that he was able to pass it. So, um, we're getting to the point where, um, yeah, it's going <laughs> to, it's coming up. Surprising what a paint job will do, that. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, last last question that I've got. Uh, salaries. Yes. What's the, what have we got? How many levels of, uh, you've got paramedics. What else do you have for titles, I guess? So we have, uh, for the level of certifications recognized by the Commonwealth, uh, there's an EMT basic, which is a 120 hour course. We have an advanced EMT, uh, which adds IVs, intubation, and then you have paramedics. And paramedics are what get you that emergency room on wheels. They're the ones that can do 12 lead EKGs and diagnose you with those, give you all the medications and shock your heart. So we have those three levels represented um, in order to transport a patient at the paramedic level or at the ALS level, you need to have a paramedic. So all of our full-time staff, save for one right now is a paramedic. One of them is an advanced. Uh, we found, we started years ago with, it was four paramedics and four EMT basics. And those EMTs had since gone to paramedic school. And as a standard, having two paramedics on the truck are very important for us. One being scheduling, because if you have an EMT and a basic and you're, or excuse me, a paramedic and a basic and your paramedic is out sick, now you're scrambling to find either overtime for another paramedic or that per diem, which um, is difficult. We have a lot of per diem EMT basics that can help fill that shift. The other one is the standard of care that the patient receives. So a lot of us think, well, one person's driving all the time. Well, in reality, yes, but the majority of our treatment happens at the patient's side where we find them. So if you're in your home, in your bedroom, or you're on the sidewalk, or you're in your car, we send two paramedics to all of those calls. So one person could be st starting an IV and drawing medications up while the other one is doing the EKG and things like that. Yes, one of them will eventually drive, um, but we, we send two paramedics to bounce those ideas off. We're not infallible. So having that, that second set of eyes and, and the second mind there helps. And then as, particularly during COVID, when you're doing an entire call in a Tyvek suit with a respirator, being able to trade off those roles for each call um, we say, if you were in the back with a patient, we call that teching a call. Um, and so you have one paramedic provide that care all the way to the hospital, and on the next call, they switch places. So they're both available on the scene to provide care, but then that first one gets that respite of being able to drive and get out of the respirator and out of the Tyvek suit and kind of recover. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're able to consistently provide such a high level of care for all of our patients and our, our staff aren't nearly as burned out as they are in other places. So what's the salary grade for a paramedic? I don't have it, so I just asked him, for, just give me a letter. Yeah, number, uh, on the existing class comp for FY22, the salary grade for a paramedic uh, starts at a step one of 22.62 an hour, and at a step 10 is listed as 33.94. Yeah. Um, and so normally you would hire somebody and then every five years or so, we do a new class comp, so you'd kind of reset and ratchet back down. Um, so you'd always kind of be in the middle of that step range, but that's the current step. Under the proposed schedule, um, the starting salary for a paramedic would be $29.73 an hour. Um, and that goes up all the way to a step 12 on this chart, which is $39 an hour. This is um, commensurate with what paramedics are are earning elsewhere. And so this actually brings us up to that level, allows us to compete with other services as well for um, higher quality providers with uh, more experience. Tim, again, for step one, you're opening 22 something and the new is 2973? Correct. Yes. Yep. Um, our. Do you still have eight people? Uh, uh, we are currently at nine full time, including myself. Um, we will be adding an additional two in order to be able to intrinsically 
organically cover all of our scheduling. Um, so that's where we need to get to to actually cover all of our hours. Um, yeah. And our, our, all of our per diems right now, um, right, they're making right around $23 an hour, which pales in comparison to what they would be making someplace else, and certainly for overtime at their regular job. So they're really going to celebrate come July 1st, then, aren't they? Yeah, assuming this passes, it's going to make it a l way more comfortable for us to be able to staff that ambulance and find coverage without having to go to overtime. Yeah, absolutely. We actually, yeah, we, um, I think three of our full-timers right now who have been full-time with our department for five years, I think, four or five years, will be reset at a step one. I mean, and, and that, that is not a reflection of how much we will be overpaying them. That is a reflection of how much we have been underpaying them compared to the market. So um, it is uh, at least... From a management standpoint, I, I mean, they, they deserve that for, for what they're putting in. I just want to chime in and comment on that being completely immersed in healthcare workforce issues right now. And um, it, it's the sort of thing where you, like, you can't understate the stress, I think, that um, healthcare professionals are experiencing and dropping out of the workforce. and. You know, I, I obviously I have a particular perspective and healthcare and, you know, emergency services is going to be a stronger government priority for me um, based on that perspective. But um, I think, yeah, I think there's no way we're going to get out of, we're not going to be able to avoid uh, increase in compensation for any medical professional um, employed by the town or anywhere else. Um, so it is, it's, yeah. a, it's a huge increase over the years. Um, the personnel costs on it is not the part where I would, I would have an objection just because of what I'm seeing in my own industry. I wasn't objecting. Yeah, well, I just, it's a lot. I mean, it's, sure I it's a lot yeah. and it's different, but like the, the healthcare environment right now, I mean, I'm in the different field. I'm in primary care, but it's like, I can't tell you how many times we have raised individual work groups up and up and up and up because of the competition. Um, it's really intense. So just just chiming in there for, for what it's worth. Yeah. Anybody else? Have, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, it's and it's not it's not disagreement with, with the budget. Um, give or take the town has a budget for municipal budget, $5 million range. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but let's call it $5 million for, because it works out nice and neatly. Your, your increase in this, in your budget, for the town of Deerfield, is about $100,000, not quite, 80, 88000 or something like that, uh, 89000 $88,723. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so give or take, that's about two percent, a little less than two percent of the total budget. And it's not, you know, we tell people, and I'm not suggesting that you should have done this, that two percent, so that five million, two percent of the five million is a hundred thousand. So if I look back through the budget and I have, sort of, I'm seeing budgets that, for the most part, 2% doesn't exist. It's 4%, 5%. And so it, it, what it makes, makes it difficult is by the time we get to town meeting, what is our total budget going to look like? So my question here is for the select board, are you prepared, if necessary, to recommend a town meeting a proposition two and a half override? I'm not prepared, but I think it's going to be needed. Not maybe not this year, but certainly we got to reset. Corner. We're going to have to reset. Skip, I tell you every single year, if it's a structural fix, we can do it. 
but it needs to not just be a, a free car, you know, free to spend. So it needs to be a one-time adjustment and that's it or whatever. I'm, but it's too early in the process to, for me to commit. But I am not just, it's not a free go and spend. I, I don't usually, I mean, I don't support an override just to fix our expenses. It needs to be a one-shot deal. It's, I, if I, it's, it's to, to a, set up a capital stabilization fund or to do some other kind of adjustments. If we have enough, then it might be worth it. But otherwise, we have to figure out what we're going to do. Well, that, that's, that's the problem that, that I'm having with these budgets is do I recommend, am I willing to make a recommendation on it, knowing that when we get through with this or suspecting that we get through with this process, have to come back. We're, we're not, yeah. we're at that point where we're looking at Good point. something well in excess of two and a half or three percent. Skip, I think you're touching on a process issue that I, I think is really a appropriate and that maybe we want to just talk about a little bit, which is our process for this budget and for the entire town budget is to go through individual departments, individual budgets, approve them, make sure they're sound, and then we get to the end and we go, oh crap, like this budget is too big, right? because you don't know what it's going to add up to until you, until you get to the end. And we don't, I think in the past, we haven't had a great, or at least not a very transparent process for how to like roll back and reevaluate and look at that. And I do think we need an opportunity for once these budgets are all individually approved mm -hmm. on their merit, on their reasoning and logic and their numbers to say, you know, we need to bring the whole thing down by, you know, 40%, which is never not gonna happen, but, um, right? But like, say it's an enormous amount and we know we need to change it or 2% or whatever it is to reach something that we think can pass. I think we need to be clear about what the process sure. should be for that. Um, and I also think we need to have enough time to work it out because the other thing that happens is we go right up to the wire before town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I'm thinking about it or the way that it's been forming in my head and I guess, sort of what I would propose is that we get as much of this done and then look at, even if we're waiting on a couple of stragglers, mm -hmm. I know there's always some pieces, but we can look at the whole thing minus the stragglers and then maybe have those conversations and, and maybe pick out who needs to go back and, and cut some expenses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because otherwise it, it feels really, um, arbitrary you know like it's always the big budgets that you know the police budget's always a big although that we never really give chief Pachurik a hard time but it's always the big budgets that that send those red flags for us and the things with the big percentages but those aren't necessarily the areas that are the best to cut right. um, if we need to so I, maybe that's a maybe no i that's totally agree it always bugs me joy. like me if life were perfect we would have the total on day one. Right. Yes. And then we would go into yeah. this saying, you know, which right. ones are we going to? But I mean, last year I felt like we did exactly that, right? Yep. We went through all the budgets, we got to the end, we said, oh man, yep. this isn't going to add up. And then went back and looked and targeted yeah. and went and revisited several. Because that's budgets. a matter of priorities also, which yes. shouldn't right. be just the select board or just the finance committee or just <laughs> the capital improvement committee. It's like, Mm -hmm. Right, those priorities should be like a group conversation, yeah. and and um, I, think I agree. It's clear from the beginning that like we need to have a process for that. Yeah. Well, I think I think we do. I mean, the fact that we're it's really consensus driven. I mean, all of us want to be, um, you know, I don't want to say conservative, but I, we want to make sure that we are spending our money wisely, and that's why I refuse to even consider an override at this point because we don't we don't really have an end yet on where our budgets are and what our you know spending needs to be what needs to be done so i i think it's way too early skip and i and i think our process is consensus driven we have good conversations so i i think we'll work it out i wouldn't i'm not panicky yet our increases are not unreasonable given what's happening with hiring of people and um, the, it's a generational 
switch. We have people retiring and, and it's, and the people that you're hiring want more money and, and it's just tough. And, and so there's not much we can do at this point, but just keep looking at it. We, 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 are, we are stuck with the drop two and a half and, and the limitations that it places on us. And that's, that's as much my issue as anything. And, you know, basically, I'm going to vote for your budget, and there have been several budgets that I'm not going to haven't, you know, just have abstained from. Uh, but it, it is one of those things where I do get concerned, you know, and I know we're going to get hit with it someplace along the way. We'll have to all come back yeah, for sure, look it over again. Well, and we might have to make some tough choices as a yep. town. I yep. mean, that's right. Like if if it comes in way too high, we can't afford everything. And yep. but I just want to make sure we're looking at the yeah the full picture when we start making those tough choices. And and maybe it would be good to do like a sum you know a summary of of the total like mm -hmm. a little closer to the beginning than the very end. <laughs> like, yeah. so that's what yeah, That's what yeah. This kind of but to but to have a yeah yeah the end we can use that but to structure a discussion about it um you know when when most of the big pieces are in at least do we have enough together that we can not yet, yet? no it's no. too early so okay. we add that to our agenda maybe in april have, <laughs> have it ready for next week right oh yeah <laughs> right on that Okay, any further discussion on the on the EMS budget? I have a question that I should know the answer to, but is EMS being impacted by the um, Massachusetts healthcare payment reform stuff that's happening? Uh, the short answer is no. Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, the long answer is our, our, we have a contract for medical billing. That is an area of expertise that is not related to actual healthcare. I don't know if any of you know this, but uh, <laughs> yeah. so we contract that out. Um, we've been very happy with their service and part of the service that they provide is tracking legislation that may impact us and keeping on tabs of those things. So um, they are advocating for us and we have not seen that type of impact. We're also uh, emergency only at South County EMS. Um, so we are not doing interfacility transfers or discharges or dialysis runs that are normally impacted heavily by contract negotiations with healthcare insurance companies and things like that. So um, we do not have those same hurdles. So I actually have another question. Yeah. I was trying to sum it up, but um, the 397-966, when yes. we vote that, um, you get that no matter what, right? That goes into your budget. And then if you spend less than that, it just goes into your retained earnings and we see benefit next year. But there's not going to be any, like many of the other budgets, you just don't spend as much or you spend more. And yeah. OK. <coughs> All right. Any other discussion? So yeah. Go for it. The operational reserve, that is not intended to go into retained earnings, right? You know, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. So yep. you're hoping not to spend it and Correct. That, it funds it'll itself. be available. Yeah. Yep. Then I think we need, I think it needs to be looked at. And again, I have to go back to the operational expenses not going up. If they go up, the operational reserve is not going to be $100,000. So if 100000 is your target to keep that, then the budget, we need to assess more to the towns. Zero is the target. Yeah, I, I'm not totally tracking on what. Well, if you want to keep $100,000, you're hoping you don't spend it. So yes. it'll go into retained earnings. Correct. And if it's acknowledged that the operating expenses are too low on here, but if they come higher, we can use the operation reserve to offset it, then you're not going to have $100,000 going into retained earnings. You're saying if you so, under budget supplies, it's going to dip into retain earnings for this budget. Is that what you're? Yeah, in effect, yeah. But but then, if if he has a higher call volume, he's going to have higher revenues than he budgeted. So also. if supplies go up, revenues so, uh, go up. Yeah, but he has a higher call volume in here. A higher, yeah, right. But, but 
Yeah, but he's, John, we, we're on track for about 1,300 calls, which is way more than what um, Zach is estimating right now. And we have a good percentage of private insurance, which fully reimburses us for every run. Um, it's only Medicare or Medicaid reimburses for almost break even or dash less. But, and that's where a lot of, um, you know, less fortunate communities run into trouble for their ambulance, but we have a high percentage of private insurance. And so we get reimbursed, you know, I mean, we make money on our runs. So I, I that's not the issue. If the volume goes up, the expenses are going to go up. Yeah, I think to, the, the expenses would go up, but our what Carolyn is trying to say is that the revenue that we get per call outpaces our expenses per call. Yeah, I agree. Because what we're paying for is the, the paramedic knowledge, not the stickers and not the Band-Aid, like primarily. And so because we have capacity in our current staffing to absorb higher call volume and thus generate more revenue, we're not, we're offsetting any additional costs in supplies here or there. I, I think the supplies, if I, I'm just trying to summarize, I'm not sure. All right, how about fuel? You can have more calls, you can have more fuel. Yep. Not, not the price per gallon, but just the gallons used. Cor correct. And right now, based on the information that we have for the past six months, we are right on track to hit that like $10,000 mark. So if you know what the cost of fuel is going to be in two days, I'm happy to change this number. But Not the cost of the fuel, it, the amount of the fuel. Uh, agreed. But again, we're reimbursed for that in our in our revenue per mile when we bill insurance too. So so if our revenues go up, we're also not having to dip into retained earnings. And and just for the first six months of this year, we've taken in three hundred and fifty thousand. There's there's a generally a lag of one hundred and forty to one hundred and sixty days on the average for collections from a private insurance. And that's where we make our money. And so it, generally we're pretty good. I'm I, John, I, I just, I think I agree with you that sub, I think supplies are under budgeted here. Um, Cause that's what you're looking at. Well, not like just the, supplies, and any of the operating expenses. Yeah. If the volume goes up, yeah. you're gonna have more calls. Well, except mm -hmm. You're gonna have more expenses. Except that some and of it's the not expenses, recognized here. But except that some of the expenses aren't specific to call some of them are, are oh not all, not no not every so one of them gonna, no so not every one of them as the volume of calls goes up the the expense ratio is going to shift in their favor and i right. think there's an inherent but it's still going to go up i think there's and an if it goes up yeah. what i mean john we can we can put more money in there but i can i finish don't think on? we need to can, well, i'm expressing my opinion on it okay if yep. if the operating expense is going to go up because call volume goes up then either and you want to keep the operational reserves at 100,000, you're going to increase the assessments to the member towns, or the operational reserve is not going to be 100,000. That's the choice we make. Yeah, we are increasing. We're, we're paying instead of paying 300,000 out of your field this coming year, it's going to take 390,000. But maybe it should be 420,000. Well, it is reflective of additional staffing, John. That that is really where our costs are going to increase, because it is as Zach was trying to say, it's the paramedic, it's the people costs. Yeah. But we're but we're putting a blind eye to the expenses. I I, I think because I what you're because saying, we John. think it's covered by. The operation reserves, which it is. John, I, I think but, I hear exactly what you're saying because I had circled some of these expenses as not having gone up over the last year. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what the way I'm, at least the way I'm understanding it, that I think is a little different is that if those supplies go up, it's because of increased services. And so those increased expenses, if they happen, which we don't know what's going to happen with COVID and blah, blah, blah. but. If that happens, it would be accompanied by an increase in revenue that would cover it. But so the increased revenue is already on here. It's, it's already on here. It's increased by fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, but that's a Another that's modest, a pretty low increase yeah. compared. Yeah, we've already we've already uh, uh, seen that's my opinion. Yeah. Seen that. Yeah, we're I, seeing that already, John. That's the only thing. It jumped out at me. I circled it too, and you know. 
I, I just for me, I think it, it doesn't feel material, um, which is why I, I, I didn't. I don't know when you're building member towns. Yeah, I, other towns. I, I think I, if I'm going to be totally candid, right, like I think because we, we are a enterprise fund and we do have the luxury of our, our additional revenue coming back and kind of funding ourselves <laughs> and lowering assessments in the following year, it's easy for me to be lazy and think I don't need to change these numbers, right? Like, sure, right. maybe maybe fuel should be twelve thousand, and maybe vehicle maintenance should go down to twenty thousand. The net difference is zero, but it, it would be more representative of of what we would expect to see in the following year. So I think probably the bottom line, we're not going to see like be, for all the reasons we just discussed. The bottom line is going to be the same no matter what. But I think you're right, right? Like, so we could we could do a much better job trying to hit some numbers here that were better representative of of what we're expecting to happen. Yeah. On all of our other budgets, all the prior years except for last year are actual expenditures, right? Am I? Mm -hmm. No. No, no, it's budgeted. They're all? It's uh, budgeted. They're shown. No, it says total expended on every year. You can, you can see. Um, Let's at see. the bottom. On the so bottom that, of the other that's, budgets. That's yeah. what we right. budgeted yeah. for the expenses. Oh, it's here too. Total expended. Here we go. Out of our. Because it's the, that is. Yeah. Oh, because, because it's, it's that's exactly that what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On these budget sheets, it's, it's always the budgeted figure. Is it all expected to the same way? Mm -hmm. It's expended as in, right, you, the, the town spent that money by putting it into the enterprise. Fund. So yeah. that is the total amount that the town spent on the right, enterprise right. fund. Yeah. So nowhere on here do we see what you actually spent. You could subtract the retained earnings from each year from the expended. Yes, you could extrapolate that it that way okay. out. Yeah. I mean, when we had that old ambulance or the ambulance that kept breaking down that lemon, we were spending a huge amount of, on repairs and it was a scramble. But since we've gotten the new ambulance, our maintenance on ambulance has gone way down, you know, for repairs. So yep. you know, we were budgeting for not enough for repair work. And then now it could be considered almost over budgeting because we only have that third ambulance that potentially has a lot more trouble. So, you know, I, John, I totally understand where you're coming from and I appreciate you trying to um, look at this, but I, I honestly feel comfortable pretty much with where we are. I think we can cover what we're doing. That's not the issue. The issue is whether the operational reserve will stay at $100,000 for next year. That's my problem with it. Yeah. I know. Okay, enough said by me. I understand um, what you're okay. saying. My feeling is that this is already sort of an alarming increase. And um, if we spread the pain over two years, like I'm sitting here blithely assuming that next year is going to be better. Um, <laughs> and that if we end up spending some of that op um, operational reserve this year, that will still be in a better place than a 28% increase next year. And I'd rather pay it next year than this year, but. Well, if we're, if we're on track for 1300 calls say, which is a, a huge increase and we have a higher percentage of private insurance or a, a steady percentage, if you look over the, our period of years, then we should be okay for next year. We'll have generated enough revenue that whatever we used of the reserve could then be put back without, you know, worrying about it. That That's my thing. Just a death, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, and I, yes. And the, I way, the way out of this, would you like to make a motion to increase that? Or do you think that we can just move on? I don't know, should we vote it as is and I abstain or do we make a motion to change it? I, I, I'm I kind guess, of I guess you're asking like you, me that, yeah, right? What the I question wanna is do? to you, do you wanna make a motion to change it? I'm not feeling like you have a lot of support, but <laughs> then I no, then I won't. I don't want to make that motion. All right. Um, any further discussion? 
No, but just before um, we vote, I want to disclose my conflict of interest, which I don't think I need to recuse myself from, but I am married to the director. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hi, Allie. Hi, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I just, you know, um, right. put that out there. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded that we recommend the SCEMS Enterprise Fund for $397,966. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, um, let's do a roll call vote. Beth, would you like to start? No? Allison, why don't you start? Uh, Allison Vandervelden, aye. Can, can be aside. Julie Chalpin, aye. Yeah. John Peresky of Stain, but I would like to say you do a great job. I'm lucky to have you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that passes 501. Thank you very much for coming and explaining. All oh, I love talking about stuff I know something about. That's, uh, <laughs> makes it exceptionally easy for me. Thank you. Okay, so next on our agenda is Senior Center and Council on Aging, but we are not going to do that tonight, so that is pushed off to a future meeting. Um, so we're down to the town clerk items, which Brenda is going to present. For right, us. treasurer, collector, and town clerk. Account number. So we're going to start with account number 145 5410. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. So there is a um, some meeting right after this one. CIPC meeting at seven. So we're going to wrap up by seven. Okay. Um, Great. So we'll go through as many as we can up So to we'll that do point. as many as we can. Okay. All right. So do we have a motion? A motion to recommend uh, treasurer collector expense 145 5410. Do a second. I'll second it. Okay. 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 So this budget, uh, really most of the increase for this year is due to the actuarial that is required every, every other every year. year. And she put in $6,400, which I would assume she had gotten from our actuary uh, for the price, because it is a little bit of an increase from the previous uh, time that we had this done. But you can see if you compare the budget for 2021 to 2023, uh, we're just $600 different. What's this comment about the recap for tax title? So in addition to this budget, um, the uh, treasurer has the ability to add more money in expenditures to the tax title taking mm -hmm. on the recap, which she has consistently done for the last four or five years. So it adds to her budget. Um, it's, it's an item that that ends up being um, covered by the local receipts, basically. Okay. Yeah, but it is an amount that she's expect she was expecting that we would add to that so that we'd have enough money to do some of the things that we haven't done yet, like the auctioning of the land of low value properties that we have. Um, she writes here the potential land court foreclosure on Romanos Romanowski. Um, I'm sure that there's some other things that that she would have in mind there, but you may have any questions. No. All right. It has been moved and seconded for one forty five fifty four ten at thirty seven thousand seven hundred ten. Any further discussion? No. Allison. Allison Vanderveld and I. Can, can be a sign. Julie Chalpin, I. John Peresky, aye. That, that passes 600. Okay. The next budget we should look at then is the town clerk budget. And that's 161 5410. Do you have a motion? Um, I move that we uh, recommend the town clerk expense account number one. 6151, 61, 54, Second. <laughs> In the amount of 25,560. Sorry, second. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
the only increase in this budget is the fact that in fiscal year 22, we had only one election. And in fiscal year 23, there's an anticipation of three. Now, I know we have the library um, vote that needs to happen, but we have um, the state primary that's gonna happen in September. We have the state election that's gonna happen in November, and then the local election, which happens next May. I would hope that, um, sounds like from Candace's conversation that the November ballot might include something on there for the library. If we have to do a fourth election, then our budget is probably too low. Given our fiscal situation, I feel like we should try to recommend to the library that they stay within already scheduled, um, you know, budgeted elections. Having an additional election is a you know an you know an expense that we don't need to take on. Right. Plus, a lot of work. Casey okay. has a hand raised. Casey, we actually had this conversation at Capitol last week. And the library, uh, the library director was consistent in her message that their fundraising group um, has recommended that this be a completely separate election to focus the attention on the library project. Um, she did listen to us tell her that because I brought that up myself, but frankly, they are loath to do that because they want, they would want the ballot question to be completely focused on passing the library question. In other words, that the funding for that library edition. Well, then maybe the library can make a donation towards the town clerk's expenses. I hear you, Carolyn, but I just wanted everyone to know why they've been told that that's not the best way to, and I think Candace might frame it a little bit differently, but my take on it was, for the best possible outcome, framing that in one separate way mm -hmm. would be useful to the project. Because you're not going to bother going out to vote unless you're voting for the library. Well, that's, you know, so that my, my vote on this would be to highly recommend we do it on an election, especially a high election when you have the most turnout of the town yeah. to vote on a very important yes. subject like this, not to separate it out. Of course, the consultant is going to say put it on its own vote i mean that then you only get people right. voting for the library coming out to vote right. for it i think on on something so consequential as this for the town for the amount of cost that it was going to be to do it most people at the ballot i, I think our, our residents are extremely intelligent and they'll be able to flip a page over and see that there's a vote for eight million dollars <laughs> on the on the page so I, I highly recommend and forcefully recommend that it's on one ballot that we're already paying for and everybody's already traveling out for. I agree with Trevor. Yeah. Well, and if, if we have that special <laughs> town meeting in late fall to vote on this, people are going to be there for the library and they're going to know that right. the election is going to be in November for that mm -hmm. particular project, right? Yeah. yeah. If we get the mm -hmm. word out. Yep. yep. Casey. I would want to remind Trevor, he was at the same meeting. Um, there is, and you're the one that brought this up, Trevor, is I would remind everyone that there is a deadline that that ballot vote would have to be taken Yep. Um, related to the question passing at town meeting if it did pass. So this is a coordination thing that we're going to have to keep an eye on because not only is it a lot of money, but it's, a, it's significant internally and Though I agree that we should keep it on an election, a regular election ballot, I think I wanted to present everybody with the the devil's advocate in my mind, but also the actual the actual response from the director. Do you know off the top of your head what that deadline is? I don't. I would have to ask. I thought they had six. Oh, six. I see. They have six months for ML. MBL. There, yeah, there's different deadlines, but Brenda for the deadline from the time the town votes at town meeting to the time of the election. I, I think it's 20 days. I, I think, yeah, I think Trevor's right. I think it's 20 days, but um, I want to say- I hadn't asked. Sewer vote, but I could be wrong. Okay. Skip, do you remember? I want to say it was 20 days. But. It says be less than or more than. 
Uh, no more than. No more than ten. Is there I, um, is I there some okay. sort of limit um, deadline before, like, if you put it on the November election, when do you have to get that ballot? There is a limit for that, Julie. I just don't know what that dead. That's a clerk function. They would we would have we would do that research and then back into that timeline. Yeah. Back it up. Well, this is very interesting, but the budget question. Right. <laughs> but the budget shouldn't increase, right? Any other discussion on the budget? <laughs> I assume we want to leave it at 14,000 for the the election. I think we all feel comfortable with that, Julie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, it has been moved and seconded for line item 161 54 10 for the $25,568. Any further discussion? No. Oh. Allison Vandervelden, aye. James Cambias, aye. Julie Chalpin, aye. Skip Olmstead, aye. John Pereski, aye. aye. All right, that passes 600. Next. Okay. Let's go to tab nine. And we're going to look at 911 uh, 5400. That's the Franklin Regional <coughs> Retirement Assessment. Wow. Motion? A motion to recommend 911 5400 at 623 521. Second. Second. Okay. So uh, this we don't have a choice in. Uh, we've been assessed our 794,811, which is 23.07% of an average of the last five years worth of salaries for the salaries that are included. Um, we've done the offsets here. Uh, the SCEMS offset is in their budget. The senior center offset, it will be in her budget. And uh, the wastewater treatment plant offset is in their budget. So that brings us to 623,521, which is a 10.65% increase. Brenda, do you know why it's so high? I, other than their assessment keeps going up, the percentage that they charge. Okay. Salaries have gone up, Carolyn. That's yeah. why. Yeah. Okay. All right. That percentage, that percentage is higher too. The twenty three point oh seven is that higher than it was last year? I think so. I thought last year was twenty two point six one, but I, I can't remember for sure. <laughs> that could have been the year before. So. Memory to be unsure <laughs> about. <laughs> Why didn't all the offsets increase by that amount? They decreased. Because their salaries were different. Um, so, so when we do the offsets, we don't, for simplicity purposes, we don't figure five years worth of salaries. We base it on last year's calendar year salaries. So it's never going to correspond exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that's what this wastewater treatment plant comment means? Mm. Yes. No. Correct. It's framed. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Any discussion? You can't not spend it, right? Yeah. We don't have a choice. So, all right. So, it's been a moved and seconded for the Franklin County Regional Retirement at six twenty three five twenty one. Any other questions or discussion? No. Allison Vanderveld and I. James Cambius, I. Julia Chalfin, I. Skip Olmstead, I. John Pereski, I. All right. That passes six zero zero. Okay. Let's go to the very next one, which is workers' compensation nine twelve dash fifty four hundred. Do we have a motion? I can make a motion to uh, recommend workers' compensation 912-5400 at 40,928. Second. Okay. So this one is a little bit of a shot in the dark um, to a certain yeah. extent. So <laughs> it seems like every year we budget and every year we end up spending less than what we budget. 
So for this current fiscal year, we've spent 39,000. So when we, when, when Barb came up with this number, I questioned it because it's barely above what we're paying in fiscal year 22. But on the other hand, it can't be off that much. So, so what, what Barbara always does with this, um, and hopefully the new treasurer will, is she takes our payroll numbers for, for calendar year 21, and then she figures in what she thinks might be a payroll increase. So in this case, she's thinking, okay, 3.5% on an average of all the, all the salaries. Adds that in, comes up to um, that number, takes it times the workers' comp rate for each of the, each of the um, uh, departments that, that uh, Maya breaks out, comes up to that number and then says, okay, they always give us these discounts. We're gonna assume a 15% discount this year. Sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's less. So we said, let's plan on 15. And then we get a 3% uh, discount if we pay early. So based on that, we came down to 71,721. And then um, from that spreadsheet, she has the SCAMS amount um, calculated it exactly the same way we, we did the rest of it. And uh, that number is in the SCAMS budget and then the wastewater treatment plant uh, also. Um, we don't break out the senior center because the senior center is just considered clerical. You can't really, it, it's, it's all included and it would be minimal. Be so, peanuts. Yeah. so that brings us down to the 40,928, which is really only I, I think I figured it this afternoon, it might be 1,600 or 1,800 less than, or more than what we're paying this fiscal year, but maybe it'll be close. We're hoping. I have no, um, no, no suggestions for a better way to calculate it. It's really it hard seems because like we just a... don't know what they're gonna give us credit for. Um, and, and we did have our audit done this year, and overall we're getting a, a credit. And Casey, I haven't looked at that yet, but I need to look at it and determine whose department is affected and how that affects our total. But, um, but I do plan on that. I have that on my list. Brenda, what was our experience rating last year? I have no idea. Okay. Well, if we didn't have any claims, then that probably is not going to be a, a factor. So oh. then... Or, you know, or very few claims, then so we should be okay. Okay. <laughs> so the total expended does not include. So there's offsets for skims and wastewater treatment. So that total expended is just for not including skims and wastewater treatment. Right? Correct. It's just the whole. Yes. That's correct. yes. Yeah, when we get the bill in, I have uh, Maya break that out for each of the departments and then charge them directly when we pay the bill. Any questions? Anybody else? Discussion? No, all right. It's been moved and seconded for workers' comp for $40,928. Discussion? Sally? Allison Vanderbilt and I. Is Julie Chalf and I. Skip Olmstead, I. John Pereski, I. All right, that passes six zero zero. Okay, let's go to the very next page for unemployment insurance, which is nine thirteen dash fifty four hundred. Motion to recommend unemployment insurance nine thirteen fifty four hundred twenty seven thousand. Second. Okay, so uh, basically the budget is set up um, to be the same amount as fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22. Um, you see what we spent for fiscal year 21, which is 53,000. So far for fiscal year 22, I wanna say we were at 14,000. So it's hard to tell how the year will end up, but I figured 27,000 would be um, a comfortable number that we should hopefully be under. School School's in session. Uh... And, and so I think um, because of that, there shouldn't be any layoff of part-time people and stuff like that um, that we had during COVID when it was not, um, you know, open for part of the time. So 
I, I would say that this is a good estimate. So if there's if the unemployment goes towards school people, we pay that. That doesn't get charged that's, back to the school at all. That's in correct. Any way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Those are one of those costs that go in that are not really fully accounted for. We we account for it as school related in a, as a total towards a budget, but it doesn't come across as a school related expense in their budget. No, it has been moved and seconded for unemployment insurance at 27,000. Any further discussion? Allison Vanderveld and I. Can be assigned. Julie Chop and I. Skip Olmstead, I. John Pereski, I. That passes 6 0. Okay. The very next page is group insurance for the town. That's 914 5400. <laughs> For three hundred and ten thousand nine thirty nine. I move to recommend group uh, account number nine one four fifty four hundred for group insurance. Second. Okay. Um, so this is a this is a calculation that um, is done every year for this budget, and there were no plan rate increases, so they will be identical. There is. Um, anticipation of a little bit of money for new employees that might be added during the year. And then you have the offsets here for uh, what would be expected for uh, scams, wastewater treatment and the senior center, which are all in their budget as well. Um, and, and this is so, so what Barbara has done with this is she's taken what what we were paying in December and extrapolating it over 12 months. Hard to tell what people are going to do, whether people are going to make changes to their plans and people do on a regular basis make changes to their plans. So um, that's extrapolated out and then the um, anticipation of changes is plugged in there. She's always been fairly reasonable with with uh, with her calculations and um, it does reflect a 6% increase, but you'll see, you'll see on the next page that we're expecting an increase for the schools. So can you in one minute or less explain why it decreased so much from 2018 to 2019? Was it if it's a long story? So, never mind. so 2007, Just curious. 2017 and 18, the school portion of the group insurance budget was was included in one budget, this okay. budget. Yeah, so it was in 2019 that we broke the two out and put them in two separate line items. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Any other questions or discussion? Sure. Okay. All right, so it has been moved and seconded for group insurance town at 10,000. <coughs> Thirty-nine. Any more questions? Um, Vanderveld and I. James can be assigned. Julie Chalf and I. Skip Olmstead I. John Pereski I. That passes six zero zero. Okay. So the next page is group insurance for the school. It's nine fourteen dash fifty four ten, and that is figured at six hundred and thirty five thousand four eighteen. Motion to recommend 914-5410. Second. Okay, so here again, the calculation is done exactly the same, uh, figuring a 2% a, a increase for whoever might add to their plans or any additional teachers that they get that might get a bigger plan. Um, there is an offset here as usual for the shared teachers, because there is a bill that's sent to Conway and to Waitley and so on and so forth for the teachers that we share, but we have their health insurance and um, that's plugged in here as well. So the net is 635,000, which is a decrease of 3.36%. That's the way it worked out. Any questions? Um, just out of curiosity, what's the decrease from? 
I believe, I, I, I couldn't tell you for sure because I don't, I don't, I'm not privy to all the information except that I think the school has fewer people working for them than they did before COVID, right? Did, uh, can anybody speak to that? Yeah. That's what I think. You have a lot fewer students. <laughs> it's, it's my Seems theory. Like there are probably okay. fewer. <laughs> Just wondering. Yeah. How about other expenses, per personnel related expenses for shared teachers like retirement, um, workers comp, do they, do the, uh, well, those the teacher, towns get the, billed for that part of it too? The teachers don't, we don't, the town doesn't pay into a retirement for the teachers. Um, OPEB? I mm -hmm. had, I would assume not, and I don't know if that's a state law that you can only, you can only, um, bill the other towns for insurance. I don't know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that's right, but I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I suspect that the insurance for retired teachers is, is in here someplace, right? It, it is, so. I, I'm gonna guess that's within the town. What's that? I'm gonna guess that that's probably in the towns um, to some extent, because we don't know if you go back very far, we don't know who's a, who's a so-called. No, the 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 school. Uh, in there's an anticipation of the of the school's portion of the retirees' health insurance is eighty nine thousand seven hundred, oh, okay. and for the town, it's eighty seven oh fifty seven sixty. So those are broken out. Um, we know who the retired teachers are and who they who who are retired town employees. There's a spreadsheet that Sarah and Barb keep up on a regular basis for that. Is the offset the money we get back from the towns when we share a teacher? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Brenda? Yes. Is there any way in the future that we can split this out and have the health insurance go against the uh, school budget instead of our budget? I've already tried that. I've, I've only been on asking it. for that for eight years, but, um, and, and Barbara too, and we can't seem to get anywhere. Um, that, that was asked again this year, and that was a definite no by the school for that. It is a separate line item. It is a separate line item, so, so the town can see that. Can we renumber it to 600 and something? Not 600 for the school, 300, 300. something. <laughs> don't, I don't, don't know. go there. Beth okay. says technically yes, but please no. <laughs> that's what, that's what Brenda's are. expression is. That's kind of beside the point of whether yeah. we're going to approve this thing. Yeah. So, um. <laughs> because then it wouldn't be in the proper place. It would be, you know. Oh, I see, because it's a. It's, okay. it's, it's really a benefit. Uh, yeah. yeah, all right. <coughs> Um, any further discussion? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so it's been moved and seconded for group insurance school at $635,418. Allie? Allison Vandervold and I. James Camby is I. Julie Chalf and I. Skip, you're up. Oh, Skip Olmstead, I. John Pereski, I. <coughs> that passes 600. We are at 658. So I think we need to stop. Evening, there's only like one there's more. one more there's one more we'll do it uh medicare insurance which is 1.5 1.45 of all your salaries um and barbara has done this calculation again it's next page based on history and um felt that the 103,386 was a good number Mo motion to recommend medicare insurance uh it's budget number 916-5400 at 103386 Second. Any discussion or questions? Do we have a choice? <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. Out. Allison Vanderveld and I. James Camby is I. Julie Chalf and I. Skip Olmstead I. John Pereski I. All right. That passes six zero zero. Great. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Any opposed? No. All right, we are adjourned. Okay. Next meeting is next Tuesday, right? Oh. Next meeting is next Tuesday, 2 5, 5 p.m. right here. Did the select board adjourn too? Uh, I think. Oh, should we adjourn this one or just move over to the other? Um, it's not on the same recording. Okay, so a motion to uh, adjourn the select board. Okay. Dave Walton, second. Okay. All those in favor? Dave Wolf, am I? Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Thank you.